thank you for coming. Thank you, Frank, for inviting me. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself so you can understand where my comments are coming from. But first, I want, for my benefit and for Melinda's benefit, to ask you a little bit about yourselves. How many of you have technology or ideas you want to commercialize? How many think they might be interested in doing that in the future? How many of you think that if you commercialize your ideas or technology, that's what you want to do to make a living? And how many of you think that you'd like to see your ideas commercialized, but you really want to stay in, say, academic medicine or practice? And how many of you are MDs or soon-to-be MDs? And how many of you are PhDs or soon-to-be PhDs? And how many of you are both? OK, that helps us. And who amongst you have actually tried to start a business or commercialize something? OK, great. So as I say, I just want to say a couple of things about um, where I come from. And um, then I'm going to make a couple of comments using some slides, which I understand will be up on uh, the web. So you don't need to take notes. And then what I'd like to do is see if we can get a conversation going, because I can be most helpful to you if I understand what your questions are. And especially in a university, there are no such things as a dumb question. So ask them, because that helps your uh, neighbor in, around you. So I have been doing life science venture capital for about 28 years. And that is kind of coincident with what a lot of people think of as the great biotech commercial revolution. And the industry has changed and matured. So that if I had asked those questions that I just asked when I started, I can assure you there would have been no one in the audience and no one would have raised their hand. So we, we've come a long way. And my personal journey to doing healthcare venture capital is I started out as a academic. I'm a former professor of pathology. And then I migrated eventually and landed up doing venture capital. So my career has been one with a consistent interest in the life sciences and understanding that the really exciting observations and results and questions that people in academic medical centers ask eventually are useful for the um, folks who are the patients who we want to help because something has been commercialized. And so that process is one that's interested me and clearly um, interests you. So you've had a couple of sessions in this uh, boot camp, which is, they look very interesting to me, although I haven't um, been to them. And if we can look at the next slide, please. Oh, or do I do that? Ah, no one told me that. Can you hear? OK, so how do I do this? You can just click. OK. So um, our topic uh, today is to uh, talk about what you have to get together if you're going to talk to someone who's going to help you hopefully provide some resources if you want to commercialize your idea or technology. I think the very first question as you think about what it is, is to think about, is it really a company? You know, sitting here at NYU where one of the great pieces of um, technology that has been a great success both to patients and financially Remicade was licensed. It didn't, wasn't used to form a company, but it was commercialized. So a great thing is to think about, is your idea a product? Is it a service? Is it a full company? If you're not sure, who do you talk to to determine that? And the difference between licensing and forming a company is something that each of the sessions has touched on, and I'm sure we'll touch on in a little bit more. So my topic today is to talk to you about the business plan and the pitch to the investors. What's the purpose of it? I think it's always a good idea to ask, why are you involved in a particular exercise? And the first thing is to get your ideas together, get them crystallized, 
be very clear what it is you're talking about and what it is you want to happen to the idea or the technology, and to get an investor's attention. I'm speaking to you from the perspective of someone who for almost three decades has looked at literally thousands of business plans year after year after year. When you look at the statistics in the industry over that period of time, I'm not aware they've changed. So if you talk to someone who works in a venture capital fund and you say, how many investments do you have to consider before you decide to make one. Over the years that I've been in venture capital, it's something like someplace between one in 100 to one in 250 ideas or companies or opportunities really go forward. And so one of the things when you put together your pitch or the plan is you want it to capture someone's attention. You want that exercise to allow the person you're talking to to want to have a subsequent conversation. So I like to say that if your business plan gets you a meeting, it's been very successful. But it's just the beginning of a long process. And I believe that in a subsequent session, we're going to talk a little bit more about that. Now, one of the things that often frustrates people when they've got a great idea or they um, have a vision of what they want to do is that the people who they talk to bring different things to the party. So it's very important to think about the kinds of conversations you're having and match the information to the conversation and what it is you're trying to accomplish. So I've just listed um, four different kinds of conversations you might have about your technology or your potential business. And I call them the elevator pitch, the investor presentation, the business plan, and then the due diligence process that would allow someone who's interested in working with you and helping you commercialize your activity to actually dig into the details. And each of these different conversations require a different level of discussion. So we may play a game in a couple of minutes, but an elevator pitch is something where um, you get on the elevator on the first floor, you push the button for the sixth floor, the person sitting next, standing next to you in the elevator says, what do you do? And between the first floor and the sixth or the seventh floor, you have an opportunity to tell them concisely what it is. So think about that, because I think we might try it as a way of uh, focusing one's attention. On the other hand, the investor presentation if you um, happen to meet an investor or if you go to um, chat with some of the folks who are available for resources, is a way of, again, organizing your thoughts to get across the essentials of what it is you want to do and why it is that they should help you. And if you reflect back on the fact that there are many people who have great ideas, great enthusiasm, who don't um, go forward. You want to distinguish yourself with a compelling story. And the business plan, which we'll spend most of the time on, is a more formalized, written document which addresses a number of things which we'll come to. And then eventually, if you're successful and there's a group of people who want to work with you, uh, they will go into a process called due diligence where they basically scrub the information you give them and delve in. And one of the things that people often find frustrating is they're continually being asked the same question over and over and over again. But um, you have to provide different levels of um, information to um, do it. So let's go to our game of the elevator pitch. Think of this as um, kind of um, instant dating. And, but it's dating with someone who you're trying to capture their attention uh, that perhaps they will um, 
you know, kind of want to work with you. So now there were a lot of hands over here about people who had something they wanted to commercialize. Let me see them again. Okay, this gentleman right behind Melinda, you've got, you, we're on the first floor, the elevator's going up. Tell me what your idea is. Uh, right now it's uh, trying to get patent protection stuff to be very uh, tech lift, uh, but it's a diagnostic tool uh, used with a very, very common medical application that I think the whole medical community overlooked, and I'm trying to develop that as far as I can. Buzz, the elevator door is now open. And um, we'll come back when we look at it to um, improve the. But let me say something about I'm trying to get it patented. In an elevator pitch, you don't need to reveal something to someone that's going to compromise your uh, business. And there's a big difference between communicating what it is you want to do and revealing confidential information. So remember that, because if you can't tell the story without getting the quick message across, then you just haven't focused on the uh, presentation. Now, there was someone behind you who has a, you do, so what is it? Each of you, we'll get both to you. Okay, we're on the seventh floor, we're going up to 14. Congratulations. I know there are going to be people who are going to want to talk to you. And the uh, young woman next to you? Uh, we've just developed devices for rehabilitation after stroke, which are non-robotic, they're mechanical, easy to use. People at home can use these, um, and we've shown good efficacy. OK. Someone over here has something. Do we have a service? Do we have a, we have a mobile app for an iPhone, anyone? Anything that isn't um, going to take um, a billion seven and ten years to get through the FDA? Because remember, I'm a greedy venture capitalist. I want to make money in my lifetime. So we have an a, a OTC new uh, product that is a, the first and only prevention for a medical health issue that affects 50% uh, of the U.S. population. Okay, great. Great. So the idea is you want that honed very well. And one of the things you want to get in, which some of you did and some of you didn't, is not only what it is you want to do, but who cares? It's perfectly reasonable to spend a billion, seven, and 10 years and address diabetes. You could also do it for an orphan disease, which affects maybe 10 or 100 people globally a year. So part of the who cares is what the market opportunity is. And we'll talk a little bit um, about that um, in addition. So when you get to the point where you think you want to write a plan, whether the plan is to form a company or whether the plan is to describe a really exciting opportunity that you would like help commercializing. Maybe you don't want to start a company, but maybe you want um, Biogen to think this is going to be the next opportunity in their MS pipeline, or you want to talk to Novartis. Uh, these are the kinds of general um, areas or chapters uh, in the plan. And I want to start by focusing on the um, red, which says each of the elements of the plan is there to address a question that hopefully is important to um, answer. And succinctly, you want to get across the idea that you know what your business is, and you can describe it in a way that an educated layperson can understand. You want to explain why anyone should be interested. Because again, uh, remember, I like to think always try to put yourself in the other person's um, point of view. If I'm a venture capitalist and I have limited funds and I can make only a few investments, I part, my objective 
is to make that investment be successful. Part of it being successful is understanding what the market is and what the opportunity is if you are successful and your product or idea is commercialized that it will actually make money. So it's important to understand the definition of what this product or service is focused on in terms of uh, the size of the market. How? You've got to tell me. You may have, um, you've defined a receptor, you've, um, you have um, taken care of the intellectual property protection, which I think was the um, subject of your conversation a couple of weeks ago. But now the question is, how are you going to do it? What's got to happen? What's the plan for uh, development? Where are you in that process? Is it an idea that's been reduced to practice sufficient to get a patent? But is it reduced to practice sufficient to want someone to actually uh, try to uh, move it into clinical trials? So we need a description of that and a uh, timeline. Who? Who's in the organization? A company or a project is not a single person's endeavor. And those of us who've come up through academics are always looking to find something first before everyone else. In the commercial world, you're trying to bring the right entity to the market at the right time. And it's going to take a series of people and a series of activities and a series of skills. And who's on the team? Who are the people you're working with? Why should anybody care what their opinion is? I cannot tell you how many business plans I've seen of young companies where the local representative to Congress is on the um, board or the um, person who runs the, uh, the very best department store but doesn't happen to know anything about diagnostics or statistics. So it's very important that the team and your ability to articulate why they are helpful to you in whatever the activity is that you um, choose to uh, describe. And hopefully, because I can only be successful as an investor if the efforts of the company eventually make it into the marketplace, what if you get it to the marketplace but it costs so much that no one can possibly afford to buy it? What if you can uh, take it along and show that it's really a wonderful device, but in order to explain it and to sell it, you need to have a team of PhDs because it's not easy to use. And so the marketing, the sales, the reimbursement, all of those elements of commercialization uh, need to be thought out. Now, I suspect since I think I saw that most of you are at a very early stage of the commercialization of the technology, that the marketing and the sales and the reimbursement issues are not your first tasks. But you need to think about it very much in the way, do you really want to develop a drug for an orphan indication, or do you want to develop it for a larger market? Or um, I'm sure you all know the stories of the drugs that have been developed for really important medical needs in the third world, but then when there wasn't a commercial market, it was uh, not, not a success or required something um, else. The great story of that, of course, is um, river blindness and ivermectin. So then comes the financial section. And the green eye shade investors will pour over the numbers to try to understand how much is it going to cost over what period of time in order to allow you to be successful. And there's an old rule of thumb, and um, we'll talk about it, I think, at, in another section, where you always have to assume that it's going to cost twice as much and take twice as long. It's a little bit like doing an apartment renovation in New York City. So um, that's an important thing. And if you are not expert in doing those financials, that's OK, because there'll be someone on your team who is. 
but if you're going to be the person who's driving it and asking someone to support you, you have to understand the dimension of the problem. And I have the appendices on there, again, to go back to my theme of when you have a conversation, you have to capture someone's attention. And if you have spent six years, 24-7, working on a very interesting but esoteric problem, and you know all the details, and the guy sitting across the table from you just wants to know how many people are going to buy this product if it ever gets to the market, you have to put the conversation in context. And so a lot of the details go into the appendices, even though that may be where your heart and soul is in terms of the driving um, interest. So there are special problems in a science and technology based business. Any business is difficult. Um, I always, when I go have a cup of coffee, I always pull out one of those sugar um, you know, kind of packets, and you look at it and you say, that's pretty trivial. And then you try to figure out all the steps that got the sugar into that package and on that table. And then you amplify it with the problems of intellectual property, with the problems of explaining your technology to a lay person, getting past proof of concept. And the most important thing which people need to focus on is what is referred to as competitive technology assessment. You may have a great monoclonal antibody that's going to have a terrific effect. And you may be able to show it in animals. And you may have some proof of principle in humans. And you may have great um, intellectual property um, protection. But if someone else can do it with a slightly different antibody and they're already there, I may not choose to invest in you. Or there may be many different ways to attack a metabolic pathway. And when you make the case for why I should invest in your approach, it's incumbent on you to be able to explain why the other approaches aren't going to get there first and keep you from being commercially successful. So there are lots of resources to help you. And one of the things I put up on here is the um, Small Business Administration, Your Tax Dollars at Work, actually has some wonderful resources. And if you um, take a look at um, their um, training site, and when I Googled it this morning, it's the fifth one down that comes up on a Google search, there's some very interesting and clear um, information about the questions that people will be trying to get answers to in each section of a generic business plan. And before I open it up for conversation, I want to go back to that word generic. Everybody's business idea and invention is unique. There is no one template. So these is, this is just a generalization. What's critical for you in your conversation with the resources that will be available to you, you have to identify what are the critical things for your business and address them in a form that's important. If you have a medical device, let's say you have a new way of attaching um, EKG electrodes, and you have no interest in taking it to the market. Your business plan should not focus on your building a commercial sales force. It ought to focus on something else. And so consequently, you have to tailor the issues to your own situation. And I know that both Marissa and Melinda are going to talk about resources that are available. So let's take a couple of minutes. Who's got a question that relates to getting the dossiers together to help you find people who want to help you with your invention or idea. There's got to be someone with a question. Here you are. Uh, do you prefer to look at an executive summary? Get the whole business plan? That's, that's the executive summary, which the SBA training site will tell you, is the summary or the written elevator pitch 
of course, is um, what you have to look at. So, for example, I'm a healthcare um, investor. If someone sends me a business plan which tells me how they're building roads in Nebraska and they've got a new composite that's great in, on highways, I don't go any further. If I, I have certain prejudices, and we'll talk about that uh, next time, every investor is unique. Someone tells you they're a venture capitalist, they're just telling you they're putting somebody else's money at risk. Doesn't tell you what they want to invest in or how they make decisions. And so an executive summary is a very important tool, but the executive summary is best written after the whole business plan has been worked out, and it's a way of doing it. For example, years ago when I first uh, made investments, we invested in a lot of drug companies, and I'm very happy to have been associated with some very successful ones and they, they were wonderful both for the patients and the investors. Today I don't do that because the business model around pharmaceuticals is very different and it's not compatible with the kind of investments I make. Um, we do a lot of health IT these days because it's more compatible with the style. So yes, that um, executive summary is very important but think of it as the elevator pitch on paper. Because if someone's sitting with a pile of business plans, I, everybody does it differently. Most of the people I know read the executive summary and then they go to the section to see who are the people involved. Do they have the skills? And does it meet their particular investment parameters? Someone else must have a question. Who wants to try their elevator pitch again? So, if you're a scientist, you know, how do you go about? Um, I don't think I know how to go back for it. Okay. Um, how do you go without stealing uh, Marissa's? about the resources, but let's say you're not at, at, at NYU, you're so mm -hmm. How do you go about answering those questions? Well, I think that there are a huge um, number of resources. First of all, they're simple questions. You should have an answer, and then you go um, further down. But I think uh, we're going to hear from Melinda a little bit about some resources that the city has. I do not know a business school in the country that doesn't have an entrepreneurial clinic where uh, people are eager to use their business skills in an uh, experimental way. I'm sure that uh, there's a list of, for example, um, health science and biotech companies in New York that are entrepreneurial and young. And I don't know of a single one, if you sent an email, someone wouldn't get back and be willing to chat. And there's also, as I was saying to Frank, there's also a, a number of, especially you live in, you're fortunate to live here, and not that it's often to live in, in, you know, Iowa City, it's a nice place, but you have so many networking events here. Some of them are, are biocentric and ethnocentric, where you will meet people who are very happy to speak to you. Sure. And love to be in the mentoring role. Yeah. The, uh, the New York um, chapter of the uh, biotechnology industry organization. Um, and I'm sure that your office has these. OK. Um, this is just one slide on a few resources you have available to you. And it's not in presentation mode. Uh, um, so first of all, I want to point out this. Um, a lot of you have told me you have trouble navigating to the resources page on the NYU website. So the main website for entrepreneurship is nyu.edu slash entrepreneur. Also, though, if you go to bit.ly slash NYU eResources, you're going to see an entire page of resources available to you, both within New York University and within the city. And then it's also segmented by resources for life science entrepreneurs and tech entrepreneurs women entrepreneurs, first-time entrepreneurs. There's 
almost everything you, you know, could think of is on that page, so write that one down. Um, additionally, we have three new programs going on. Some of you may have heard of them. Um, the first one is our Entrepreneurs in Residence program. We've mentioned it in the newsletter. Hopefully you guys have gotten that. And uh, what this program is, and we actually have one entrepreneur with us, um, it's a, a way for NYU to bring in experienced entrepreneurs that can provide ad hoc counseling and mentoring to you and to your startup. So, you know, it's, it's not necessarily regularly scheduled meetings, but this is every time, you know, you come up with some sort of question you're really grappling with and you just don't have the experience to know how to deal with it, you can sort of bounce ideas off these people with a lot of experience. Um, you can also use them to explore your uh, business model in general and then your development plan more specifically and also to think about your funding estimates. Is it realistic what you're telling your VCs that you need? Go back and ask some of these EIRs if they agree with your plan, if they think your estimates for your funding needs are realistic. So um, Melinda, who you'll hear from in a minute, is actually one of our EIRs. So um, we have six, they're all online. Two of them specialize in life sciences, the rest are in IT. And uh, if you go to this URL, bit.ly slash NYU EIRS, you'll be able to sign up for some of their office hours online. Uh, next is the Venture Fellows. This is a program where we team up some of our MBAs who are interested in trying to help scientists write business plans and launch companies. We team them up with uh, our scientists. Usually we like to team them up with one PI and one um, either grad student or postdoc or, e or if it's an undergrad. But we like to see one junior and one senior basically who are trying to move a technology out of the lab and we'll bring in some MBAs usually that have some sort of relevant experience and try to pair you together. Um, what this is for, this program, is not necessarily for um, someone who has a technology that's ready to write a plan and get funding. This is really for a lot of people like you who have something that is not yet venture fundable, but you want to sort of move it down that path so it's closer to becoming a proper company. And if you would like to be considered for that program, you can get in touch with us directly and we'll, we'll talk to you more about it. Um, last is the Tech Venture Competition. This is a competition that's been going on at NYU for a really long time, but in the last two years we've recently started the, or Frank has started actually, the NYU Tech Venture Competition, which is really geared towards people with a tech-heavy component to their business. And um, what they say is by going through this competition, at the end there is a $75,000 prize, but really it's the process that you'll get the most out of. It's eight months of training, workshops, and mentorship, and you really spend that entire eight months totally immersed in your business, and you come out of it a lot more developed than you were going into it. Um, and the 2012 winners were just announced last week. These are Seymour Technologies. Is anyone here from, I don't think so, from Seymour was a collaboration of a PhD candidate here and an MBA student. They actually found each other during the first kickoff session because the technology founder was looking for an MBA to help. There was an MBA there interested in entrepreneurship. So sometimes these competitions are also great ways to add people to your team. Um, and RF Test Labs, which was four PhD candidates with specialty in imaging, um, they were P, uh, their PIs were Dan Sadikson and uh, Yu Dong Zhu, and um, they were also winners. So normally the 75,000 goes to one winner, but this year the two winners were so excellent that the prize was divided between them. So. Um, that's something you should definitely consider if down the road you feel like you're ready to start a plan and really look for some funding. And um, if you have any other questions, you know, feel free to reach out to me and Frank. And Frank, is there anything else you wanted to mention? Just, just to say, both of the Venture Fellows, the Tech Venture Competition, and the next groups or cohorts will kick off in the fall. So keep your eyes on the newsletter. There will be more information about both of those. Um, they'll both start late September, early October. Um, but you know, depending upon where you are, uh, you can make a decision on what's, what's right for you. And Marissa and I are also happy to, to talk you through that as well. Mm -hmm. So that's everything. I'd love to introduce Melinda Thomas now, who is going to speak to you all about uh, team membership and how to think about building your team and roles. <laughs> All right. 
so um, that's what an EIR for New York City does. I help you <laughs> get, uh, work on your business ideas. And really, if you have an idea and that's all you have, and you think you're serious about wanting to start a company in New York City, that's the only parameter. And Westchester and Long Island don't count. I've learned that. Those are not boroughs, five boroughs. Um, feel free to uh, come and talk to me, and I'll, I'll give you some more information about that in a second. So my name is Melinda Thomas. My experience um, for this is that I helped start and run companies in the San Francisco Bay Area. My first company um, I went to right out of business school. My interest has always been in science-based companies, but I chose not to take OCHEM in college, so that kept me from getting a science-based degree and instead I got a, what I called applied math was a business degree. Um, when I came out, I w went into manufacturing of life science instrumentation. The first company was uh, made DNA sequencers, among other things. I went from there to um, a startup. And the startup was uh, seven guys out of the Stanford Genome Technology Center and myself. They had never even worked in a company, knew nothing about companies, but their lab had spun out nine companies. So they didn't know they weren't supposed to start companies. They assumed that that's what they were supposed to do. So a, they went to a VC, and the VC said, none of you have ever started a company, never, none of you have even worked at Baskin Robbins. You need somebody who's <laughs> done a little bit of this. And I apparently had met this VC at some event, and so he sent an email to both of us saying, you two should meet. And the, one of the guys sent an email saying, great, how about Wednesday at 3? And I said, OK, great. Uh, apparently, we should meet at where your signature block says. And that was all the information I had when we went to meet. I showed up. There were seven guys. They pulled up their PowerPoint and showed me their business idea. So it really can be that spontaneous, let's say. Um, and so um, we, we got funding. At, uh, I consulted to them for about um, a year while they were thinking about their idea. So these things take a long time. You get an idea and you kind of mull on it and you run it by some people and you change it a little and you think that you're ready and then maybe you're not and you talk more about funding. So um, the first question they asked me and in terms of when you're building your team is what would I do for them? Why did they need me? My experience had been this manufacturing organization and what I brought was I wrapped a company around them. There's a lot to a company besides the technology. And so I said, I'm going to do everything you don't want to do. I've used that in two companies, and I got hired both times. So I think it's a pretty <laughs> good line. And, and literally, that's kind of what I do. I help them figure out all the pieces they don't already know. Um, so when I talk about how that team was developed, um, that's one experience about um, how to figure out your team and, and see what you need. And then my next experience so with that company, um, when I left, the venture capitalist from that introduced me to somebody who else who was thinking about starting a company. And in this case, he was a serial entrepreneur, um, but he was a very busy serial entrepreneur. And they knew they needed somebody who could run the internal workings of the company while he focused on the external. <coughs> and we started actually with a business model, which was we wanted to develop diagnostics um, in uh, personalized medicine for cardiovascular disease. Large market, new area, diagnostics get to market faster than therapeutics. That was basically it, and we knew that we'd be able to find the biology that would uh, answer some of the critical questions in those areas. So that team started with uh, a serial entrepreneur, um, myself becoming serial, because that was the second one, and um, a scientist, a medical person, and a bioinformatics person, all found just through um, relationships from other companies. So that's the experience I'm um, going to talk about. So th as you saw, teams, the first thing she looks at after the executive summary is the team. Because they're giving you money, not because your idea is great, but because they think you can follow through. The team you have can follow through on the idea. So you look at your idea. You say, what are the challenges going to be that we can figure out now, because they'll change. What are the challenges we're going to have trying to get this to market and making money? And making money, right? 
Um, for the diagnostic that we started, the hardest thing was actually going to be uh, reimbursement. You'd think that there are a lot of other things before that, but reimbursement now, they, they were changing the bar on it. So we very early on realized we had to have a person who was very good at figuring out the reimbursement landscape. And very early on, we hired somebody who I wouldn't even tell people her name when they would ask me because I was afraid they'd steal her because it was that important. Um, so that, just as you were saying, you want to look out and see what's important. Okay, so, but that's further out. So today, you have an idea. It's probably you, maybe, maybe one other person. How do you decide who the next person you get involved is? Um, there's a book called The Founder's Dilemma, and I, I blogged about this. I, almost everything I'm going to tell you I've blogged about. <laughs> I blog once a week. It's two or three paragraphs. Very easy read. You can get it sent to you by email. It's basically going to be everything I know. <laughs> by the end of the time I write, uh, finish uh, writing it, it'll be everything I know about anything related to this. Um, and so, um, where was I on that one? Oh, the Founder's Dilemma. So it's Noam Wasserman. And he walks you through how do you decide whether you should found by yourself whether you should bring in another co-founder, how you decide which co-founder, should they be a friend, should they be a family member, should they be a former co-worker, should they be somebody you don't know at all. And the great thing about the book is that it, he has data from what has worked and what has not worked. And he also has case studies. So um, as I mentioned in one of my blogs, you guys really like data. You don't want somebody just to tell you something, you, they want, you want to see the data backing up the statement. So this book has that uh, data. So the first thing I would do is read that book. Once you've done that and you've decided whether you want to bring more people in, um, you do want to think about probably somebody who has some business knowledge. Now, I did write a, a blog that, about a physician as entrepreneur because as physicians, you see the problems that need to be fixed. All businesses should start with, I'm fixing a problem because people will pay to fix problems. It's not a technology. They're not paying for a technology. They're paying for a solution. And so you're in there seeing what the problems are, and you're probably the best people to try and figure out a solution. Once you've figured out a solution, you probably need somebody else to kind of help you figure out how to make a business around that. But if you start with a solution, and you say, OK, who's got this problem? Then you know who your customers may be. And you figure out, well, how do they solve the problem today? What's the current standard of practice? And then from that, you can figure out how much they might be willing to pay. So your business can just start that way. So you, to get to your elevator pitch, start with that, con those concentric circles. So you don't need an MBA to help you with that. You can figure that piece out already. Um, but then once you want to start putting numbers by it and everything, you probably want somebody who's comfortable running those numbers, so a, a business person. But you also want somebody who has some idea about markets, how to sell things. So in New York City, there are a lot of people who know about money. That doesn't necessarily mean they'll be good as your business person in, with your idea. Knowing how to analyze some numbers is not the same as having a vision for a company and leading a company. So if you think this business person, you make them the CEO because they did mergers and acquisitions, that's not quite the same thing. They probably didn't have anybody reporting to them, so the, the elemental leadership they might not have. So what you're looking for is somebody who's managed people, somebody who can look at a market and figure out how best to sell it and can create a vision. And even more important than creating the vision is getting people excited about the vision. That means investors. That means potential employees. And anybody else you have to give, get resources from. So customers. customers, yeah, her money. So as you look around, that's the kind of business person you're, you're trying uh, to get. Uh, another facet of a business person is if your business is going to be built on patenting, continuously patenting new ideas, having a lawyer who has worked with um, small companies is another way to go for your sort of some of your business expertise early on. 
So you also think as you're going toward um, the business part of it, um, the term sheet or interacting with a VC, that you have to know everything. Your attorney actually is going to be your best resource there. I get people calling me up, I'm talking to investors and they're about to give me a term sheet and I don't know what numbers should be on there. And I said, and you went in without an attorney? Your attorney, if you've got the right kind of attorney, is looking at term sheets every day and knows what the market rates are, what those terms that usually get negotiated, whether you're paying 15% or you're paying 2%. So you really want to have a good attorney who, and an attorney who deals with emerging companies, small companies, all the time because they have the market data for you. So yeah, don't go into those without um, that, that kind of person. You want to raise your hands? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. All right. I mean, you guys, <laughs> you guys are, are part of the team, right? You're sitting there. You're working it through. I mean, you, you have an interest in them succeeding. You're only a good client to them if you succeed. So they, yeah. So. One question about yeah. So it's, there's no you, okay. there's an entity, there's a company, and there's a university. Actually, maybe we should address this question, if you don't mind my sure. interjecting. Um, it depends what point you're at in the process. If, if you're, you know, we, we, we love the idea from the point of view of the school, the office of industrial liaison, that you're interested in being an entrepreneur, licensing yeah. something, creating a company, and taking on this, you know, certainly with our support and Frank's support and everyone's support here, um, before that point, it's, before it's licensed, it still belongs to the university. Right, that's a very important point. It's not your technology. Okay, it's NYU's technology. It's NYU's tech, well. <laughs> Assuming you signed your agreement. When you right, and they, you, yeah, because they paid you to develop, they gave you the resources to develop it. So it, and, and just so we don't sound so horrible, that's true of any company you'll love to work with. Right. But, but to clarify... It's a, it's a good point, and you might also talk about the fact that if the federal government has funded the research, they too were part of the equation. No, see, but the, I mean, if the VA here, they have, I had to look into this, they have some memorandum of understanding by which they own everything. So the NYU owns everything. Correct. Um, Correct. But I will have to talk after. But I think to answer your question, though, if when you say me or I, you mean your company, yeah. then the company needs its, once you're forming a company, the company needs its own legal representation. That's, Wigan and Dana's a great example of the kind of firm who can help you do that. I, I think Andrew's point was when you're talking about, you know, filing patents while you're still here and all that, the university then can represent the interests of getting the patent and protecting it and all that. So that, that's when the, the equation changes and when the company needs, and I think that's what was Melinda's point, when the company needs counsel or legal representation because you're now negotiating with the university, that's when it, or when you're beyond that point, the company needs its own counsel. The university is not looking out for, you know, NUCO's best interests. Okay. And you had a boot camp on that, right? We had, a set, we had a session about it, yes. Yeah, so th that's another good place to get that. I mean, talk to Scott and his, yeah. his guys here about this uh, during the reception as well. Yeah. Always, always go to your tech transfer or office of industrial liaison, is that yeah, the name? Yeah. Always go to that first because the IP, after you probably look at the management team, the next thing they probably look at is do you have the IP? And so, or how strong is the IP? And so that's what they're making sure you have strong IP. If, if that's what the company needs. So you want to? Beyond that, I mean, we, we also, when you're looking at that stage, there's a lot of resources available. I mean, we do put together companies more, but people bring in other resources. Yeah. So you got the company and you licensed the technology from NYU. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so to do that, part of it is they want to understand that you actually have a, a good company that's going to be able to make use of this technology. Just the same way the VCs want to make sure you have a good team that's going to be able to move the company forward. So um, 
there's, the, there's who should be on the team, and that's really looking forward to what challenges you're going to be facing and trying to get those kind of people. Um, the role that I've played was always, uh, I called it the number two person. So there was an outward facing person, was the CEO, and I was always the inward facing person, so I ran the company from the inside. And you need to know what you like to do and, and, and what, what you're good at. And so I get asked to be a CEO all the time because there are so few <laughs> in New York City who have any experience starting companies uh, like I do. But I know that I like running the company. Um, that said, I may actually be forced by my mother, my stepfather, my husband, and New York City <laughs> to be a CEO at some point. But being the CEO is not the be all and end all. It's one type of job. So don't get so wrapped up in that title that you think you should be the CEO. Being the CEO also does not mean you have control of your idea. It doesn't mean you're the one person who gets to be a dictator. If you think you have control of a startup, you're you're doing the wrong thing. <laughs> it's, it's a roller coaster ride. You need to be adaptable. And you need to understand that you've taken somebody else's money to see a vision through. And that's what they're investing in. They're investing in the original vision you gave them. And your job is to work toward that vision unless you present another compelling vision that they're willing to let you change. So um, that's, the, that's the kind of team you need to put together is toward that. So I think I'll move on a little bit more toward um, how, you dis how, how you, different ways to put together a team. You don't have to just hire people. Like today, you probably don't know a lot of people. So one thing you might do is your PI, if you're not the PI, you might ask if they would be willing to chair the scientific advisory board. Because beyond the management team slide that's in this sometimes, is the scientific advisory board. And sometimes I've been seeing a lot of a business advisory board. And basically what they want to know is that you have good people involved in some way. So even if they're not an employee, if the head of your scientific advisory board is the head of the department and the smartest person in the world about your thing, showing that they've signed up to have their name associated with this <laughs> gets you some credibility. Uh, the company that out of the Stanford Genome Technology Center the head of um, the Stanford Genome Technology Center agreed to be a founder and the head of the SAB. And because what we were trying to do was a research tool for pharmaceutical companies, for them to bring in a new research <coughs> tool is very difficult. They have to change a lot of their procedures and protocols. So they really wanted to know that this was going to work. And to see his name associated with it gave them a lot more sense that this was good technology and that would work. And as you get more people involved, and people who are willing to put their name on to these things, it starts building some momentum. It makes people feel like there's something there. And it may attract other people who may be um, willing to be more engaged and be employees, potentially, or consultants. So you can start small. Start with what you have. Start with what's around you. Start with the people. Um, and to Frank's point, talk to people about your ideas. You're the people who are in this class or in this boot camp right now because you're actually taking a step toward trying to implement it. The hardest part is implementing it. A lot of people have ideas, and I'm sure almost any idea you have, somebody else in the world has the same idea. So the novelty is not so much just in the idea, it's in your ability to implement it. So you get a lot by talking to other people, running it by them, seeing what they think, learning from that. So I encourage you to do that any, and go to a networking events. Um, so I'm part of New York City, nyctechconnect.com, and we put on networking events just specifically for bioscience entrepreneurs um, so they can meet each other and people who are interested in doing that. Um, and they're free and they're close by here. So um, if you go to NYC Tech Connect for the blog or for that, you'll find it. Um, they're also typically in our newsletter, in the bio entrepreneurs newsletter for those of you who get that as well. Right. So you have an, a tremendous resource. None of the other universities have the resource that you guys have for entrepreneurs. It's incredible. Every, every piece of it and the energy that you guys have put behind it. Um, so use what they have because there's a lot there. OK, so there's um, getting people on your SAB, getting people on your um, 
uh, business advisory board is a, one way to start. The next way is consultants. So when do you make somebody a consultant versus an employee? The first thing is consultants are really project based. There's a beginning and the end to what you're asking them to do is the best way to think about it. If they're going to, you need them for the long term, probably sounds like something that might be an employee. You can have part-time employees where they don't work, you know, uh, 40 hours a week or 80 hours a week, really. Um, so that's one way to start. And if you can't write a clear definition of what you need from them, you're probably going to be paying money that you aren't really watching carefully enough and you haven't defined well enough what you need from them. So if you can make it a project, it means you've got clarity of thought about what you actually need from them. So that's one way to start. The idea that you could um, just be yourself and hire a bunch of consultants, you still have to manage consultants. So at some point, you do need people who can actually be part of the company and work. So um, at the point you're going to start hiring employees, um, you want to uh, be careful about that. So the number one thing in hiring employees is always hire high. Do not settle ever in your employees. Do not say they're good enough. And I've written a couple of blogs relating to this, particularly if you've been in scientific labs. You're used to people kind of coming in, going out. You didn't hire them. Somebody told them to show up and work next to you. They're only there for a little while. You're working in parallel. You're not actually having to work together. You may not like them very much, but you know they'll be gone after a while. The PI got them on a grant, so he'll let them leave or she'll let them leave once the grant is over, even if they're kind of a non-performer. You're not used to looking at somebody saying, would I hire this person to do what I need to get done? We have research that needs to get done, milestones that need to be hit, and I need somebody who can do that work and do it well. You really, really need to be very tough about those hiring decisions. Because one really good person can do the work of 10 people. One mediocre, kind of OK, they seem good enough person will do work of half a person and bring everybody else down. So in my last two companies, the one thing that I know I left them with, because they both joke about it, is I would not allow us to hire somebody, no matter how badly we thought we needed them, unless we thought they were a superstar. You, you think you need them today, but if you wait a month or two months or three months to find a better person, it will make the next two to three years much better. So if I leave you nothing else, make sure you hire really well. Now, none of you may have ever hired anybody. And in fact, the guys out of the Stanford Genome Technology Center, when we brought in our first candidate for a research associate, they all said they seem good enough. <laughs> like, good enough. They're going to be your RA and your only RA. Oh, my RA. Oh, my only RA. I, I don't know. I don't know. Because they never had to think about that. And I said, well, at least do this. Think about the people you haven't liked working with. Put together a phenotype in your brain for that and check this person against that. At least make sure they aren't like anybody you didn't like working with before. <laughs> and it sounds funny, but that had not occurred to them. Like, to make sure I don't hire bad people. The second thing is, if there's anything that slightly annoys you about them you don't like, that was in a half an hour, 45 minute interview. Just amplify that over time. If you don't think you want to sit next to them every day eating lunch, and if there are only seven of you, you're going to sit next to them every day eating lunch, don't hire them. So on the material science, um, NYC Tech Connect, we actually spent a bunch of time trying to find all the material science pockets in New York City. Yeah. So send me an email. Okay. And enzymatics, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> so what an enzymatics person. Um, but if you guys do, he's looking for somebody. So, and I'm sure there are postdocs who are looking for jobs. So what kind of company is it? Uh, it's diagnostics. Diagnostics, okay. All right. So on the diagnostics, I'm going to tell you my, my last company was a diagnostics company. Number one thing, it has to change physician's behavior. If they do the diagnostic and they get an answer, they're going to do something different than if they didn't run the test. One end is... My technology is actually so involved with that that if I could talk okay. to you about this. Okay. Okay. So. All right. That's the number one thing. And people don't think about that. that classic case, strep. How many people know people who go in, get tested for strep, 
They go home with the antibiotics, start the course of treatment, find out a few days later whether they had strep or not. Why did they do that test? The physician did not change this behavior. Gave the, so there's no point to that test. I mean, maybe there is. But anyway, that's one end of the spectrum. So you want to make sure that they change the physician's behavior. And to get reimbursed, you not only have to change the physician's behavior, show that it did something different. You also, they're starting to make the bar even higher, which is change the outcome for the patients. So if you're doing diagnostics, remember that. Somebody else was trying to hire somebody. Were you trying to hire somebody? If I do decide to start my own company, I'm going to need a whole team. Right. Question number one, do you want to be part of a company? I mean, you personally have to decide. Do you? Well, I think I can only do the science part. I'm not going to be part of the management of the company, the CEO or COO or any of those but things. But do you want to be in a company or do you want to stay in academia? That's well, I, I want to stay in, I'm going to keep my day job. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, so if somebody licenses your technology, they're going to want to know that you're happy to talk to them and want to be involved. The, nobody comes and gets technology and walks away and never speaks to you again. You're part of the package. So um, that's something to, to know if you want to be involved. A good company anyway. Anybody who didn't involve you or call you or want to talk to you about it? That'd be crazy. <laughs> <laughs>